Schwing, Hwing, Kling, Ein, Saum, Ing, Hwing, Schwing, Kae, Ila, Ring, Asaka, Halla, Ring, Saka, La, Ring, Sao, Ein, Kling, Ring, Schwing, Aum. O Bhavani, Sages and saints describe your gross forms as Kali and others. The Vedas speak about your subtle mantra forms, Kamakala Rupa. Poets adore you as the origin of speech, Shabda Brahman. Philosophers think of you as the root of the worlds, Mula Prakriti. But we devotees think of you as the universal ocean of mercy and compassion, Karuna Rasa Sagara, and nothing else. Namaste. And welcome to the fourth episode in which we will discuss Goddess Kali. Kala means Shiva. It also means various factors of time, including the time of death and it also means black. If we take this to mean Shiva, then Kali refers to his consort Kalan Kali, like Bhairava and Bhairavi. If we take this to mean time, then Kali is the goddess who controls the time factor of the universe, as opposed to the infinity of Shiva. The vastness and light of Shiva is bounded by Kali as Maya Shakti. She is Maya Shakti because of her intrinsic darkness. So Shiva is light and Maya is darkness or ignorance. Why is she ignorance? Because to have light, you have to have darkness. You cannot perceive light except in relation to darkness and vice versa. So in the dualistic world, these pairs of opposites are everywhere. And Kali represents the darkness of time and boundaries like death, as opposed to Shiva, who is simply boundaryless infinity. Kali is all about boundaries, beginnings and endings. That's time. Time is used to separate the different happenings of creation, sustenance, and dissolution at last. Otherwise, everything would happen at once. <laughs> so there's time, which is divided into past, present, and future. And these divisions themselves are illusory, because actually time is one. And from Shiva's point of view, Everything does happen at once. He is not restricted by time. He has full access to all of it. So that's why Kali is described as Shiva's consort. She's his consort because she makes possible the manifestation of the universe. She also ends this manifestation when it's time. So she is all about time, sequence, boundaries, and the darkness of ignorance that hides the future from us. Her incarnation is described in Srimad Devi Bhagavata Purana, 5th Skanda, chapter 21. The story goes like this. All gods and goddesses prayed to the Supreme Divine Mother Parashakti to complain about two demons, Shumba and Nishumba, as they were persistently troubling the gods and goddesses. Parashakti created a Shakti from her body and named her as Kaushika. Kaushika means one having pause. So Shumba means murder. And Nishumba means kind of like murder's sidekick, you know, son of murder. <laughs> so we have the big and little murders, and they were creating havoc in the universe. So 
Parashakti heard the prayers of the demigods, but she didn't want to take care of this directly herself. So she emanated a Shakti, a powerful Shakti, that became known as Kali. According to the Devi Bhagavata, she is also known as Bhadrakali, sometimes identified with Durga. And Kalaratri, the night of all destroying time, the night of destruction at the end of the world. Kalaratri also refers to a particular night in the life of a man on the seventh day of the seventh month of the 77th year, after which period a man is exempt from attending to ordinances prescribed by Dharma Shastras. So she is basically the force of time. And see, she was sent to kill these demons, Shumba and Nishumba, simply by ending their time. <laughs> you see, this is why no force of this world can stand against Shakti, because Shakti is the world. She is the tattvas. She is time. She is even consciousness and life itself as Kundalini in all creatures. So how can you stand against her if she wants to defeat you? You're finished. <laughs> it's over. But because demons are very ignorant, they want to fight with her. See, they don't understand this. They think their will, they think their, their power and their force is uh, capable of defeating her. But she is the source of their power and force. So naturally, <laughs> she winds up simply ending them, and that's it. She is described in different forms. Her unique features are her black complexion and a garland of skulls. She has four arms, and in these four arms she holds a sickle in her top left hand and a chopped head in her lower left hand. The description of her right hands varies. In some of the descriptions she is said to carry a cup of blood, and in the other hand she shows Varada Mudra, granting of boons. She is often described as standing on a corpse. Maha Nirvana Tantra describes her with two hands, one with Abhaya Mudra, removal of fear, and contextually refers to fear of death, and another with Varada Mudra, granting of boons. She is seated on a crimson-colored lotus. She has a protruding tongue which signifies that she consumes all evil things and gives only the purest to her devotees. So this is the nature of goddess Kali. In one battle against the demons, there, there was one demon who, every time a drop of his blood touched the ground, another demon equal to him in prowess would pop up. So Kali was sent uh, by Tripura Sundari to go lick up all the blood so they couldn't become demons. So she was and consumed all the blood of the demons so no new demons could be formed. And in that way he was killed. So we can understand from these stories the inner meaning, the metaphorical meaning, is that she consumes everything evil, everything negative, everything ignorant, and leaves the devotee spotless and pure. Her complexion describes both death and infinity, death for the sinners and eternity as her nature. She is beyond kala, time, hence she is eternal. Her garland of skulls explains the entire population of the universe. The entire creation is symbolically explained as skulls. Why skulls? The skulls represent the reality of existence culminating in inevitable death. The garland is said to have 50 skulls representing the 50 letters of the Sanskrit alphabet, the matrika. So this is deep. 
Just like we, we put on these ashes, huh? bhasma, vibhuti. Why? To remind ourselves that the ultimate state of the body is ashes. The body will die and it will be cremated and all that's left will be ashes. Similarly, the whole universe, from the galaxies, stars and planets, down to the tiniest creatures, all will be annihilated in the end. All will become simply ashes. So this is the destiny of this material world. Knowing this, huh, who would not want to perform sadhana to get out? And Mother Kali is a tremendous boon and blessing to the devotees who want to get out of the material world because she purifies them. She is wearing a skirt made of chopped hands, which represents destruction of the karmas of those who surrender unto her. In a short span of human existence, one's ego plays an important role. Unless one's ego is destroyed, realization is impossible. When she is worshipped correctly, she removes one's ego. This is symbolically expressed through the chopped head. The sickle represents her grace, and the chopped head represents one's ego. When she showers her grace, the first thing she does is to remove one's ego. Why she chooses to annihilate our ego, and what is the need? Tattva Bodha explains ego as ahankarta ahankara. The thought of doership is ego. Unless ego is destroyed, the spiritual journey cannot be pursued. She stands on a corpse, and often this corpse is depicted as Shiva, which subtly conveys that without Shakti, Shiva is but a corpse. So the first necessity on the spiritual path is to remove the ego. That way one becomes a pure servant of the goddess. And the goddess is life. So one becomes a servant of life. Life includes death. So one prepares for death. Death is inevitable. But death, when encountered by a spiritually awakened person, is but a thought. It's just another illusion that stands between the sadhu, the sadhaka, and the truth. So when she removes the ego, she does a tremendous favor, and we realize that actually nobody does anything. The ego is the principle of doership. I am the doer. Huh? And the more effort we put forth as the doer, the more solid the ego becomes. This is why we see that very physical people like athletes and you know, weightlifters and, you know, uh, people who do physical labor have very solid egos and they're very hard to convince about anything spiritual. So the first thing that Kali does is to remove the ego and purify us of this obstacle to spiritual attainment. Saundarya Lahari explains this concept. Shiva becomes inert without Shakti. When Shiva is not united with Shakti, he cannot manifest as the universe. Because of her dynamic nature, Divine Mother becomes supremely important. One important relationship, other than being Mahakala and Mahakali, is their abode. They live in a crematorium and burial ground. This is mainly to convey that, irrespective of one's status, our ultimate destination is only the crematorium. That's why she is addressed as Shmashana Vasini, one who dwells in crematoriums. So life is temporary, and death is waiting for all of us at the end. So should not one begin immediately to prepare for death by performing sadhana. 
Sadhana begins from rules and regulations, but very quickly transcends them. Because as soon as you actually contact the goddess, your life will improve in so many ways. It's just inconceivable how she's working. <laughs> by, by clearing out all the impurities, beginning with the ego, then the cause of disease is mitigated and one gains perfect health and the ability to function in any capacity in the world. Kali Ashtotram describes her like this. She is the destroyer of time, terrible in form, but beneficent. She is the pride of Kali Yuga, the ocean of compassion without any limitation, because she is Kali, the one who liberates, destroyer of sins in Kali Yuga. She is fond of virgins. She has a soft and subtle voice, destroys fear, and loves those who worship her with musk. Her body is fully adorned with camphor and sandalwood paste. So in other words, if we want to be purified, if we want to become free from sin, we should worship the deity of Kali with camphor and sandalwood paste. Both these substances are very cooling and refreshing. And we'll also find that the more we worship her in this way, that the more cool and refreshing that we will feel. Because this is actually her nature. By taking away all the nasty things, beginning with the ego, then <laughs> she paves the way for our ultimate spiritual realization. So how should we worship her? With Kali mantras. There's the Nava Kali mantras, Mahakala Sanghita, and they are published on the internet and I'm putting a link in the video description. And the same with Kama Kala Kali Trilokya Mohana Kavacham. And that is also published on the internet. So we're simply going to link to it in the description. But her most popularly known mantra is the Dakshina Kali Mantra. Aum Kring 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 Hung Hung Hring Hring Dakshine Kali Ke Kring 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 hung hung ring ring swaha. And there's more Kali mantras that are abbreviated versions of this mantra and different variations, such as Kring Kalyani, Hring Kali, Shring Karali. Kalyani means auspiciousness, and Karali means dreadful. So she's auspicious to the devotees, but dreadful to the demons and sinful people. So we love Mother Kali. <laughs> and this is why also she is presented first in the Dasha Mahavidyas, because she is the ultimate friend of the humble sadhu. Aung Tatsat, Aung Shakti Aung.